I am sort of working towards starting my own business. Um, I visualize myself as the uh, Chris Oliver of the, uh, you know, Southern Territories. Um, uh, John uh, Carrier is the head coach at Henry Sibley High School. John is someone I've known for over 10 years, and I really am lucky enough to say that he's a friend. Um, we started coaching against each other in the St. Paul City Conference, and uh, I remember him as the, uh, the B-Squad coach that was smart enough to go five out when I had uh, a, a six-foot six center, and that was the only thing I had. And so yeah. he drew him away from the uh, drew him away from the basket, and they won the, won the game in the second half. Um, been lucky enough to work with him at a handful of different schools, yeah. and I'm excited to be back on staff. Um, I think a lot of you know him through his online presence. Um, I think we're all lucky to know him in the way that he spreads the game, um, the way that he communicates with so many people and brings new ideas. And uh, so I'm excited to hear from John and uh, hope you enjoy his presentation. Why, thanks. Uh, first of all, honestly, when, you, when he asked me to do it, I would feel qualified to be up here. Like, there's some dudes in this, especially some dudes in this room right now, who would be better off being up here. But what I'll say is this. Um, I will be real upfront. In, in three years as a varsity head coach, my, my sparkling record is 60 or 15 and 61. But I'll also say this. I, I love the game. I spend a lot of time on this stuff. And, you know, I think it is making our program at Sibley better. I think it's helping us move in the right direction. You know, we just wrapped up our summer. And it's fun because the young guys, like our freshmen and our sophomores, who have been with us for a few years now, we're doing a lot of these things. I'm starting to see changes. Um, our young, young kids are really starting to get into it. Um, if you ever want to talk more about this stuff, I'd love to. I stayed away from the shooting stuff because I know, Chris, you're going to cover a bunch of that. But we do a lot of our shooting in a games-based way, too, which I would definitely talk about. But what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to kind of intro this. So I put Fortnite up here because how many of y'all, your kids just love Fortnite, right? Like, everybody, like, like, that's what they talk about. Like, they make fun of each other. It's, it's their thing. And part of why I love Fortnite, it's a little unstructured. It's a little bit of chaos. It's just kind of fun. You hang out with your friends, right? And you know, I know a lot of coaches get sick of Fortnite, but like, I kind of embrace that as like, you know, we are doing some things that are, you know, that are okay. Um, so how many of you have heard this? Like, I used to do this all the time, and I still do it sometimes. But you get to a practice, you get to a game, and you're like, we just did this in practice. We just drilled this. How come you guys can't get this? And early in my career, I swear, like. That was like half of the stuff that came out of my mouth was, we just did this. And so, you know, and so the games-based thing kind of helps with that a little bit. I've had to say it a little bit less. Doesn't mean I don't say it. Or, you know, you got players that kind of look like these dudes, right? Like, not exactly engaged in the practice. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I kind of have to remind myself as a coach, especially as a high school coach, we probably in our high school were the most engaged dudes in our, in our teams, Right? Like, we were the guys that loved the game, that showed up, that were excited about basketball. But if you think back, you probably also had some teammates that weren't super excited about the game or just kind of there for friends or just because, well, you know, it's just something to do. Um, and so, you know, doing a games-based thing, I've found, has kind of kept our guys more engaged. Um, so, again, you know, they're, they're, truthfully, playing two-on-two -two is more fun than doing a drill one-on-one. -on -one. It, just, it just is. Um, and I really believe this. They transfer to games. Because if I go up to a cone and I make a move, well, that cone's not moving. I don't have to read anything. And I miss that subtle, like when the defender starts to lean, oh, I can't make the crossover. I got to come back. And so when you do a lot of block stuff, and I'm not going to get into all the science of it, but when you do a lot of block stuff, you're missing a lot of cues. You're missing the environment. Yeah, I used to do shell drill. We do this for 20 minutes. And... You know, all of a sudden you put a ball in their hand and you make it live and everybody's hugging the man again because, yeah, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But we need to train guys in a game environment. And it needs to have some randomness because our game is random. We don't know. You know, even, uh, you know, I see Coach over here at, from Moundsview who runs some of the best stuff that I've ever seen. Your stuff is unbelievable. But your guys have a randomness to it. Like, I know when we scouted you when I was at Tartan, you know, you, you would run, the, run your stuff, but there was a randomness to it. Sometimes you break it off and back cut. So you have to train your players about the randomness. And I'll say this. It develops basketball IQ in a way that, you know, that I'm really confident in. Like, I love what it's doing for our basketball IQ and the basketball IQ of anywhere I've been. 
Um, it's backed by science. I'm not going to get into it. But trainugly.com is a great place to go. They've got some little videos. You know, I know, Chris, I think some of the stuff on your site, Chris talked about his stuff, but um, it's definitely backed by science. And it's more challenging for these guys. It's going to be interesting. Um, it's going to be more fun. And that's what I want. Like, I want our guys to enjoy coming to practice because that's hard. It's hard when practice is, gets a little bit long. So games versus drills, and I, and I always like to say this, you know, I, I'm definitely a games-based guy, but there's a place for drills. And for me, it's if they don't know how to do something. Like they don't physically don't know how to like, get in a stance, pass and mid, jump to the ball. Or they need a quick reminder. We, we go with drills. But when you want to teach the when, the where, the how, the reading, you got to move to some more live situational stuff. Um, and I think that's important. So my, my rule always is if the guy can execute it on air, it's time to move on. You know, with our little kids, we would do, we are really getting big into two-foot finishes. You know, coming right, left, inside, stride, stop, finish. So we would do some stuff where they would just spin it out, catch it, go. And I'm walking around the gym, and the minute that all the kids can do it on air, now we're going to go play one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to do some disadvantage stuff to allow them to experiment now with a defender. i got to go a little faster, all those other things. So don't take away from this that drills are inherently bad. Drills are good. You need drills. But, you, but I, would, I would suggest and I would recommend using them less maybe than, you know, traditionally, than like how a lot of us grew up, right? So I spent 20 minutes in a shell drill before. Um, so when you design a game, I think this is the biggest part of what I'm going to talk about. Is, and by the way, I'll have, I'll have Art send all of you this, so you don't have to like write all this down. Uh, I'll make sure everybody gets this. I'm also going to get a video. I'll make sure y'all get the video. Um, but you know, the goal, what you're trying to emphasize. Okay, we're going to use shell drill because it's the easy one. We're trying to emphasize defensive position, right? So what are the rules in, that are going to help you with an emphasis? And I'll walk through these in a few key areas. you got 45 minutes. I don't want to get too bogged down. Um, we use violations a lot. So if you do this, it doesn't count. Like if you just pass and stand, I'm going to blow the whistle. You're off the floor. Your team doesn't get to score. Or on defense, if you know, your guy, one of, one of our violations on defense always is, is talk. So if they're not talking loud enough and we're playing like a three-on-three, three, you got to get three stops to win, and they're not talking, blow the whistle. Sorry, too soft. You're off the floor. Next group in. And so we're rewarding. You know, we're like, it's almost behavior training, right? We're training habits that we want to see through play instead of through drills. Um, you know, you have to think about how many players you want, how you're going to score. You're going to score, stop certain actions. You know, we, you know, we really want to screen off the ball quite a bit. So we might play four on four. Hey, we're going to go for three minutes. Managers are sitting there counting, or assistant coaches are counting screens. The team that sets the most off ball screens is going to win. So you can use a game, a live game. And based on how you structure it, you can really do, you know, a good job of getting to what you want, but letting them play. And you're tricking them a little bit into, you know, into doing what you want them to do. Um, some of our, I'll go over this kind of habit up here. Some of our common violations are offensive rebounds, um, not talking on defense. Um, you know, we, we have a two-second ball clock when you catch the ball, one 1,000, two 1,000. If you haven't passed the shot and dribbled it by then, you're off the floor because we want ball movement. You know, if you pass and stand, that's one. Now, we don't do them all at the same time, but, you know, maybe we want to, you know, we want to push ball movement. So, hey, we're going to do, you know, the two-second ball clock. Or we want people movement. You know, if anybody's standing for three seconds or more, we're going to, you know, we're going to blow it. So, those are just some really basic ones. I'm sorry I'm going fast. I just want to make sure I get in and get you guys what you need. So, here's the format. We're going to take a common drill. And I'm going to show you a game or you know, a couple of games that I use personally to replace that drill. And why? So free throws. Just getting up, you know, I'm going to shoot 10 free throws. And here's why we don't do it. So this is the, I can't remember when Dwight Howard was playing for the Lakers at the time. So it was a few years ago now in his incredible journey through the NBA. But these are their practice free throws. This is their game free throws. And this was in their facility. Somebody got a picture of it. So the Lakers shot 89% in practice, shot 69% in games. Dwight Howard, who we all know is terrible, shot 49% during the season, shot 82% in practice. That means that there's not a transfer happening, right? He's not really getting better at free throws. He's taken, you know, 1,500 free throws and not gotten any better. 
So that's a big, that's always a sign to me of like, okay, this isn't working. It's not transferring to a game. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I have a theory that we're currently in the process of testing. That when you step to the line as a player, it takes you, you, there's a skill of assessing how far that is away for the first one. And then the second one, you're a little more you know, comfortable, which is why if you shoot 100 free throws in a row, your body after the first five or six just, I got it, I know how far it is, I'm just going to shoot, 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 right? And the other part is if you just shoot free throws, there's really no pressure. So I, I sat down over the fourth and I was like, all right, I need a game where there's a little bit of pressure, got to be a little bit of comp competition, and we're only going to shoot one or two at a time. So I came up with it, it's called the free throw game because I'm not the best marketer or the smartest dude ever. Um, so we got a guy shooting a an offensive and a defensive rebound. And at any time, throw your hand up and ask questions. So one shoots, he gets two free throws. He gets two points for each make. If he misses and three gets a defensive rebound, he gets a point. If if one misses and two gets a rebound, he gets two points. And so we always play to 15. So that figure it's about six to seven minutes, give or take, that guys go through this. And I'll be honest, our guys kind of like it. And we're sneaking in free throw box outs, because you know when are you gonna do that? <clears throat> so this was something that the second half of our summer we did a lot, and I thought it, you know, I thought it helped. I mean, you're, you're again, you're, you're really training them to step up, gauge the distance, and take the shot. Um, you know, and also then you don't have a bunch of guys just standing around doing nothing. Like there's a there's an actual purpose for your rebounders. Um, so any kind of block rebounding. Now again, look, I'm not the best coach, and I'm not going to say I am. We haven't had the most success, and I'm not going to say I am. But I'm going to say this: I'm not sure. And again, what I would suggest all of you do is take what I say and go do your own research. Go look up and see. Okay, does this make sense what he's saying or not? But the problem with block rebounding is great, again, to teach them how to hit, how to turn, how to pursue, right? We might do this early in the year to just give them a reminder. But what it misses is that moment of when to go rebound, right? All of a sudden, I'm in live play. I've got to train my mind. As soon as I see that ball up, I've got to go hit someone within the randomness of a game. And so we've taken that out, and we do it a little bit. Again, there's a time and a place. But what we do is every single defensive game, if you give up an offensive rebound, like if we're playing two on two and you gotta get three stops, or four on four on four cutthroat and you gotta get three stops. If you give up an offensive rebound, you don't get a stop. Even if you, get, if, even if you eventually get a rebound or a turnover, but what we're doing is every defensive possession we're playing, you gotta rebound it. If you don't hit and you don't rebound, you're not gonna win. And so we really emphasize that. We just kind of try to ingrain it in everything we do. You're always thinking about the rebound. Uh, we might go a step further. i got an assistant who loves rebounding. So he'll stand there and we might go, if everybody doesn't hit a guy and give him a forearm, you don't get the rebound. You don't get a, you don't get a stop. So that's what we've done. And we played you know, a lot of like defensive 4-on-4, 3-on-3, 2-on-2. We run one-on-one games. If you give up an offensive rebound in one one-on-one, you don't get the stop. Um, and I think that's helped us. You know, my first year, I think we got all rebounded by about eight. And, and we're a transition first team. We're not an offensive rebound team. But we got out, out rebounded offensive rebound offensive rebound by about eight or nine. And we cut it down to, I think, four last year. And we're sending four back, so we're not really rebounding offensive rebounding that much. Different story, different time. But we closed the gap in the offensive rebounds we gave up. And I think a big part of it was this. We just really, really emphasized rebounding. Um, cone dribbling. Now we all you know, put the chair up there, put the little kids, and let them go. Um, cones can't play defense. Right? Like They're not going to slide on you. You're not going to have to put your arm on a cone's hip, get around, make a play. So you know, in a lot of ways, we replace this with a lot of stuff. Um, I love this one. Um, it's called uh, St. Joe's 101. Phil Martelli does it. I just name him who after I steal him from. Um, so basically two lines, you know, offense, defense, dribble around a cone or a chair, run around and you get here and you start, to, you know, you have to go make a move. One of my favorite moments in this drill, I was lucky enough to coach the uh, six foot eleven kid from Hopkins this year that's going to Wisconsin. And, you know, he was like in seventh grade at AAU. And so he was doing this and he was going against one of our point guards. And our point guard went to steal it and he went bang between the legs and he went up and got the layup. And it was just like he had that moment of like, oh my God, I actually like did it on a person. Like it was, you know, he actually had to re react to, oh, he's going to try to slice me, I have to go. 
And I think this is probably one of our, for a lot of different things, one of my favorite drills. Because you got to defend, you know, you got to be able to make some moves, you got to be able to get to the rim. And if we're going to be truthful with ourselves, you know, you guys don't need six dribble moves. They need to attack hard. If they get cut off, they make one and they go. And this is more realistic to a game, I think, in that you don't know what move you're going to do. You don't know if you have to do the move. You don't know if he's a little to my left, I'm going to shake him and go. But it, to me, it makes it more realistic. Um, Tartan one-on-one. So there's a guy here, you know, about volleyball line, and he's up in you, pressing you, pushing you, following you. And while he's following you, you got to get to the volleyball. Once you do, this guy sprints up. You're attacking him, making a move, and going. So again, you're, make, you're making it live. And this guy's got to read defense. He's got to play. And again, all of these are, I'm not going to say it on every one, but everything we do, we try to put a score with. So you might be playing in a group of three. First guy to make three baskets wins. And I'll say this, the lower the score, the better, because they get less bored. If you, if you go to like six, seven, eight, well, I don't really, you can kind of coast a little bit. So we really try to go fast games and go quick, because again, then we can do one of two things. We can complain that we have a generation with short attention spans, right? Or we could just harness that and say, okay, everything we do, short attention spans, let's go. Um, partner passing. I used to love this. I was joking on Twitter the other day. So when I coached AAU back in, like, I coached in middle school because I love middle school guys, um, I, the hoops are helped me out, if some of you know him. He hated this thing. We would just do two on all passing, and, you know, and he always would tell me, Kerry, you got to get rid of it. It's terrible. It's terrible. And I was like, that was like my last sacred cow that I just wouldn't give up. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, look, you don't have to make a great pass. You can throw behind the guy. There's no consequence. You know, you don't have to do anything. So what we've done, and I, and I ran some of these before, but we cut this out, and we went to stuff like this, two on two, ten pass. These two guys can't dribble, but they can move anywhere around here, and they've got to make ten passes in a row. So what are you teaching that? One of the things that I find, I go back every year and I watch all of our turnovers. And I say, how are we turning the ball over? And one of the biggest ways, it's going to sound really stupid, but our guys don't look at the defense. They just look at their guy and throw the ball instead of looking, is the defense there? How far is he? How close is he? Can he close the distance? So this really makes you have to throw the ball ahead, you know, catch it strong because there's no dribble, so these guys are up, up in you. And, and I found that it helps us cut down on turnovers. Um, you know, in a lot of different places, I've been in a lot of different ways. You're working on guys getting open, catching with, you know, having to get open when a guy's denying you. When to back cut, how to set that up. Because if you're just cutting, jogging on a straight line, you're never going to get the ball. And it forces guys, and here again, these games, the design is to force guys to do things you want them to do in real life. To make it a habit instead of, I'm going to memorize a drill, I'm just going to make this a habit. Any type of guy's on me, I'm going to cut in a little bit, I'm going to give him space, I'm going to go, I'm going to always throw ahead. Um, all those things. We're also big on four on four, no dribble. Now we're trying to score. You can do it three, four, five. I was just doing four. Um, the less guys you have, the more reps you get. But then also sometimes you get down to two and three, it gets harder. So we go four on four. We tell the defenders to really deny. Uh, it just teaches guys how to cut hard. You know, if I just pass and jog through, we're never going to score. You know, we're just never. And if, and if you have guys just pass, sit around and jog and put a shot clock on it, and you got 14 seconds to get a basket. Because now that really just, now we got to cut hard, we got to screen hard, we got to play harder and do the things that we have to do. And the defense just cheats the whole thing because they're not going to get burnt. Um, but again, I, I think it really builds some basketball IQ. If you're a screen, how many, are any of your screening, te like off ball screening teams? There's not a lot left. Um, so this one I found is really good for that. Like really, you know, when to curl, when to straight it, when to, because you don't have a lot of time. You guys getting, mauled by somebody, i got to set that screen quick, i got to read it and cut. And it's really helped us, I think, in, in that regard. Um, any finishing drill that's not with a defender. Because there is something to, you know, having a defender. Um, one of my other favorite coaches outside, I'd say my, my like three favorite coaches are Chris, and I'm not just saying that because you're here, I say it all the time, Brian McCormick and um, Doug Novak from Bethel. And, you know, Doug... Doug has been really great to me. We spent a couple hours talking basketball a few weeks ago, and he said even in his, when he's just teaching something, he does what's called ghosting, where, Maz, get up. So, like, Maz and I might be working on a finishing move, and, you know, I'm going to throw him the ball, 
he's going to drive it past me, and I'm just going to walk behind him so that he's at least used to feeling a body. Because there is something that's fast. Appreciate yeah, you. you bet. That was great. Everybody clap for that. He's a fantastic <laughs> So it's just not realistic enough because I can drive in and I can just kind of, you know, like slow. How many guys get sick of that? Like you do a finishing drill, they come in and they just kind of throw it up on the backboard and it's soft. And you can't be soft when, you know, when you have a defender. You know, there's no like, oh, you know, like my young kids. You know, we're, doing, we're doing a lot with, you know, again, Doug Novak at Bethel off of two. And it's, if he's on your backside, it's inside hand. If he's on your inside, it's outside hand. And getting our young kids to be able to feel that. Oh, he's on my outside. I'm going one, two, and him. Or, yeah, he cut around on my inside. Now i got to really get in. i got to finish. That's not there. That happens in games. And I'm going to tell you, we did, uh, I'm going to make a plug for two foot. For, yeah, I mean, we did so much stuff one on oh. Like, we did a ton of finishing stuff the last couple of years one on oh. And we shot 44% in the paint last year, which tells me that it didn't work. So this year, everything, we had nothing one on one. It was all defenders, everything else, and it really helped. So again, St. Joe's one on one. I'm not going to go back over that one. That's another one we get. You got to beat your guy, get to the lane. Um, we'll switch the chairs. We'll move the defender's chair back. So now it becomes a chaser game, where now I'm going around, the guy's a step or two behind me, and I really got to get in. I got to finish strong. And again, However you finish, I'm not going to give you finishing points because you're going to finish different than I'm going to finish than you. So whatever it is, you, you, know, you add the points, and that's something I want to just explain too, is in these drills, like we're adding stuff. Like for example, for us, if you don't, you know, the first guy to get three baskets wins, right? If you don't finish off a two, it doesn't count because that's what we're teaching, that's what we're doing right now. So if I see a guy go up with a one foot of layup, nope, sorry, doesn't count, you know, end of the one. So again, we're building that habit of I'm coming in, guy behind me, oh God, I got to score, but I got to get to two in that moment or I'm not going to get points for it. So again, all of these things are going to have different violations or different rules that we're going to help build habits. Because if I let them just go, they're going to run in there and just throw it at the rim because they got a guy chasing them. And we got to teach them to get down, get, you know, get solid, finish hard off the backboard. Um... Chair one-on-one -on -one is one that I, I found this year that I kind of like. It's, it's just dumb, but put a dude in the chair, cut up, take the ball, and go. And that guy gets up off the chair and chases. And we really worked this summer, too, on severing and getting over, putting guys on our back. So this was one we would use to get here and sever. But either way, you're getting to the rim. you got a guy, you know, it, it would basically simulate a catch on the wing, beat my guy, he's on my inside. Now i got to figure out, am I going to get to the middle, finish middle? Am I going to be able to get in front of him, finish on the side, or do I have to go all the way across? But again, it, you know, we're going hard. It's about keeping the defender off you, playing with a trailing defender, and just honestly playing live. You know, because, I mean, we have some guys who almost have the yips where they get down there and it's like, oh, geez, got to get it up. You know, so we're really trying to help them to slow down a little bit. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. You can play it two on two, three on three, four on four. It's simple. Playing two on two, you got to catch it outside. Because if you don't, this guy will drive in, two will cut in, you'll get a layup. So you got to catch it on the three point line. And we're, we're a big layups and threes group. We just don't have a lot of mid range guys. If we did, we'd shoot them, but we don't. Um, but basically, then you're teaching you know, how to, you know, either way, however you want to go, to react to penetration, how to get open. And we do a lot of stride stops. So we're teaching here stride stop, reverse pivot, throw. Um, but again, it's about, as, it's about as live as good again. Now I'm not just reading my guy, but I'm also reading the help. I'll oh, shoot the help cam, I gotta stop. Because we have a, we have, have an app, app, you know, I don't know about you guys, we have an epidemic of guys who will run into two or three guys and just, you know, they've seen a little too much James Harden, I think, where they think they're gonna get a call. So we, uh, you know, we're really trying to do that. We'll do some, and I did put them on here, but Wahlberg's got advanced Wahlberg who did dribble drive. He's got a series of blood drills. I'm sure you run his. Those are fantastic for reading, for learning how to play out of it. Um, I would look those up too. Those are great. Um, but anything you can do, and I didn't put them on here, but you know, get to the room to finish with pressure. Once they can do that, add that next level of reading a help defender, reading a second help defender, you know, and starting to build that IQ a little bit. Um, three on two, two on one. Not bad. I think there's some great things about it. But what bothers me is that you can make three or four passes. Like, you can just kind of come down and make three or four passes. So, we try to make it a little more realistic and tweak it. So, we play one down transition. So, it's two on two, 
or four and four, excuse me, and one guy on each team has to touch the baseline before they go down. So we're playing, you know, four and four full court, like three baskets wins, or if it's defense, we're playing, you know, if we want to work on transition D, we're playing to four stops, right? And the guy that has to touch the baseline ensures us that we have one guy down on the break now. So now we've got to play out of that. And you can do this with three guys and go continuously be three on two. But the key is you got another guy coming. So these three know, hey, I only got to hold these guys off for a minute, or not a minute, like for like five to ten seconds, and that guy's going to get down there. Um, race car is another one, pretty similar idea. So two guys come down against one. When they cross half court, he's got to touch half court. He comes in. These two guys now go back that way, guy from the other team, and just keep score. First team to get three baskets wins. You know, just roll, roll through, roll through, roll through. Um, I know I'm going super fast. Is it too fast for anybody? You can be honest about it. Go back to a one down transition for a second. Yep. And again, I'll send you this. You'll have all the diagrams and all the stuff. So the one guy hits the baseline. You said you designate one person yep. that no matter what? Yeah. So like, and then this team will have one. And I'll change it every, you know, every time because it gets to be yeah, a little extra we'll conditioning. Those there, so. um, and that's the other part about this that I like the is, you know, I yeah. say the conditioning. You get a little more conditioning when you go live. You skip the layups. You skip, or not the layups, you skip the lines. You, know, you skip a lot of the standing around a lot of times. Um, so how yeah, you, you got that mess? John, how do you yeah. start it? Are you just having him grab it and go or what? Yeah, so, so for this, we might just say, hey, we're going to start 4-4 four and four here. And as soon as you know, you make it, and I'll get into kind of some other ways yeah. we start. Um, that's a great question. You know, a lot of times I just throw out and say, hey, we're going to yeah. go 4-4 four and four transition. Or I might do the old, like, circle them up. Yeah. And then we play live the whole rest of the time. Or line them up across the baseline, throw it, and we go. You know, that's how we start it, but then we just play after that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, I would say ball screen. It, it's all about what you emphasize, right? Like you could say, hey, we're a ball screen team, so we're going to run our secondary ball screen stuff out of this. You know, and, and you got to do some things. But again, my, my big takeaway is tweak it to what fits you and your system. You know, if you're a Princeton team, they should be coming down running some Princeton stuff. You know, like whatever it is. Um, so zigzag dribbles. This is a favorite of uh, Brian McCormick, who's one of my favorites. Um, zigzag dribbles. So there's no randomness, like you know when you're going to turn. And I, and I think that, again, I think there is something to reading a ball handler and seeing that subtle lean telling you he's going to change. i got to get moving. Um, and you don't get that. Plus, let's be honest, it's not that exciting. So one of the things I do, and I did this because we don't have a ton of court space. we got 20 dudes on one floor. So it's really hard to, like, you know, play one-on-one -on -one without having, you know, a bunch of guys in lines for a long time. So we just call this, you know, like no baseline. So start at half court, baseline, you can basically have the lane line, and you can do whatever you want. But that at least it adds the randomness to the game. Right? I don't know when he's gonna, if he's gonna inside out me, I don't know if he's gonna just go hard and blow by me, I don't know if he's gonna cross me over, I don't know when he's gonna cross over, but it adds at least a little randomness to zigzag dribbles, and it really helps your guy, you know, do that. When I was at Tartan, we did a lot of this, and I really thought with our dudes it helped their just staying in front of guys, getting in stances. Um, we play some Iowa one-on-one, -on -one, which is the same kind of idea. Lane lines are out of bounds. Throw it, play, and you're really working on, well, offensively, you're working on attacking hip straight line drive. But defensively, look, if you can, if you guard a guy here and you can slide him off here, you've probably done your job. There's probably some help there, whatever. So we really want to, like, you know, that guard your yard. And I think this emphasizes that guard your yard. Like, I gotta be able to move my feet, not let him get in the paint and cut guys off. Um, so shell drill. And again, we do shell drill. I used to do it for like 15 minutes. Now I'm doing it for like three minutes. I'm just rolling guys through. Um, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, my old boss at Tartan is one of the best defensive coaches. He's great. I love him. And they do a lot of shell drill. But I, I, I suspect that it's his. You know, he has a great ability to teach defense, and the fact that he's unrelenting in his, in his expectations of players in defense, that helps him more than Sheldra. Um, but again, it's memorizing a pattern. I'm jumping from here to here to, you know, and there is no gray area. What happens when this guy, like, cuts to a short corner, or, you know, does the triangle cut out there? No, you know, how does that change things? So what we've replaced it with 
is perfect position, which is when we play a lot, and I think it helps us. Um, you're playing three on three to five on five half court. First team to get you know three stops or however many stops you want wins. And any time a defender's out of position, you blow the whistle, you're off the floor. And so like this guy here, out of position, no, nope, you gotta be on the uh, you gotta be on the midline, or if you teach two feet in the paint, whatever it is. So again, we're behaving because here's what happens. That guy gets blown once, this guy's like, his teammates are like, come on, man, let's go. He gets blown a second time, now his teammates get a little louder. He gets blown on it a third time, now it, during the drill, hey, you gotta get over here. Like they're they're teaching each other, and you're making that the emphasis, not just getting a stop. And especially when you play your varsity against your JV or your second unit, right? I mean, that's a, you know, that's a question that I hear from coaches a lot. Well, how do I get my JV to compete with my varsity or my second unit? Well, now we're not even emphasizing the stop. We're emphasizing being perfect. And in here, too, we also, if you're not talking, you're off the floor. If you give up an offensive rebound, it doesn't count. So now it really makes them have to defend in a way that I hope, you know, I think we all want to defend. And it's live. I mean, we tell the offense to mix it up. They might ball screen, they might screen away, they might, you know, dribble pitch, they might just cut all over. And we also tailor it to, you know, if we're playing a team that runs a lot of cutters, we're going to say, hey, offense, I want you guys to cut today. You know, we're playing, you know, we're playing so-and-so, they run read and react. We've got to be great at jump to the ball, bump cutters. Or, you know, we're going to play St. Thomas Academy. They ball screen, ball screen, ball screen, so we're going to do that. Or they, you know, they're running their dribble handoff stuff right now. We're going to, we're going to work on that. So you can, I mean, you can get scouting report stuff out of this based on how you set the rules. Um, any kind of non-random transition. So, you know, here's the thing. This is another one. I threw these in. I kind of should have put them back up on top. But this is probably one of my favorite transition drills, these next two, um, is continuous. So you've got a team on the baseline. And now, how many of you have to practice like varsity JV and you've got, you know, 15, 16, 20 guys and you're like, what am I going to do with all these dudes? Uh, we have varsity JV on one floor, which is 18 to 20 guys. So we do this quite a bit to just get guys moving. So you got like five teams, A on the baseline, B's here, you know, C's waiting down there, and then D's on offense. So what happens is, you know, B gets a stop, they go, or D scores, they go out. A's got a ball and immediately goes, which picks your transition up. Yeah, you gotta watch, because my guys will cheat. Like, you know, won't quite have gotten the rebound and they'll be gone. So you gotta really, I almost have an assistant there to make sure they don't cheat. But they go down and it speeds that, because what we gotta teach in transition D is that mentality of the possession's over, I gotta move to the next possession now. And so that's a skill that I don't think a lot of dudes, like, I think struggle with. Oh, the shot went in, that's awesome, great. Uh, and whoop, they would blow by, right? And so we really want to train that ability to say, oh, steal, I gotta go, or rebound, I gotta go, and get that. So then D goes down, you know, A comes in, next time A will go down, C will come in, D will go off. And then, because now my guy, you gotta know your team, my guys are a little sadistic. They would rather punish their teammates sometimes than win. So what we did a lot of last year was what we called blender. So it's the same general idea, right? A versus B, but now B stays on. So if A scores or B gets a stop, B stays on defense continually until they get X number of stops in a row. So it might be three, you know, we usually went to three. You have to get three stops in a row. Well, my guys would love it when their teammates got to two stops, it was looking good, and then somebody hit a bucket. And they would just they would they would just cheer like we're sticking those guys on offense one more on D one more time. Um, man, it helped dudes get in shape. Um, you know, we added violations to it. If you're not talking, I just stop it. You're back to zero. And the hard part was the team would go you know one two three, and on that third time they're tired. You know now we're talking like end of the game right? They're tired. They've been sprinting up and down, and I still got to talk. And that was, I think, was a big thing. I think this really, really helped us um, in a lot of ways. So again, why this? You know, it's a challenge to consistently be right, consistently be there. Violations make the defense have to be perfect in the aspects you want to work. And it could be closeouts. You know, you could just say, hey, if you don't close out the way we want you to, no, nope, back to zero. And now all of a sudden you're training them on closeouts or you're training them on rebounds or whatever part of defense, you know, you want to do. 
but I found it really, really helpful. Plus, there is a conditioning element to having to sprint up, down, up, down, because the offense truly plays faster than it probably should. Um, so, 5 on over. Now, again, if you're going to introduce a set, now, I, I read it was your podcast. We talked about introducing stuff 505, right? I think I'm actually going to move to that. But it's hard to conceptualize what's happening when half of the players aren't on the floor, I believe. You know, like, what's that dribble over really look like with the guy up the line for a back cut or off the line for a handoff? What does, you know, all these different things, what does it look like? So some of the things we do, we play 5 on 5. Everybody know what time it is? 45 seconds. Perfect. I'm going to write on time. Uh, that's, that's rare. Usually, well, I, I'm a teacher. So usually when I teach, it's like we get through about half the lesson. I'm like, oh, got a lot left to go. Um, so we play 505 and we add a variety of rules and violations. And one of the things is we pick out a start. So instead of like, you know, we don't do much 5 on 0 baseline out of bounds. We just start the possession every time in baseline out of bounds. So the t one team takes it out, then the next team, then the one team, then the next team. And in eight minutes, you've gotten a ton of reps, live reps in your baseline out of bounds. And we started doing it last year more, and I noticed the jump in how often we score. Because they were better at making that read of, oh yeah, I remember when my teammate in practice cheated it like this, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, you know, we play first to like five points maybe, but we give them a bonus point if they score off of, you know, that baseline, whatever. Um, you know, we might start with a transition. We might start with a jump ball. You know, we were awful. We would give up. We gave up way too many points at the start of the year, and we would lose the jump ball. They just, you know, they run something to score. So we just even practiced that organizing our defense after a jump ball. Um, you know, that's how, that's what we run our. You know, run your sets like that. Just run the set into whatever you're running. But I think it's. I think it helps your guys to pick things up quicker, and also because everybody's going to cheat to re, you know, figure out. Okay, here's how they're cheating it. Here's what, you know, here's what I'm going to do different. Um, you know, again, it's just reading the defense, reacting. You know, how are they going to take it away? Um, Spurs three trips is always a good one. You know, it's on that Popovich video that everybody's got. Um, basically, just, you know, play 5 on 5 one, two, three. Each point's a possession. If you get a stop, you get the point. If you get a score, you get the point. And then you, whoever gets at least two out of three points wins. Live play, and I found three possessions wraps up that intensity a little bit. And again, you just add what you want. Um, so what questions do you guys have? I mean, I want to keep it short because I know if we're all going to be honest, I'd rather watch him talk. I'd rather watch Abe talk. So uh, what questions do you guys have? Strictly from a number of guys' perspective, mm -hmm. um, can you be so coach I only have eight to ten yep. mostly. Um, do you see injury currents go up with this? Because it's game based, you see it's about the same. You know, I haven't seen that. And that's a great question. I haven't, because I got to do it with somebody a while back about that, but I haven't. But the other part is because we want to lift and we want to do film, we're only on the floor about 90 minutes. So, you're shorter time anyway. so if we were gonna go like two or three, some of these dudes going three hours, we wouldn't do this for three hours. But you know, then we would splice it, you know, maybe some five on oh, some other things, but you know, we shorten it because we also go weight room, we have character development, you know, we want to do some film stuff, and just so, you know. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you know, we do all the skill work that everybody else does too, so. But it's like, hey, if we're going to be on the floor, we want to compete. You also control intensity based on half court or full court yeah. or the score. So if you shorten the score, there's less competitive. You control a lot of factors that can accomplish what you want. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else want to hear from a guy that's 15 and 61? I mean, like, you know, I got all, I got, like I said, I got none of the answers. Do you ever find that you're calling too many violations? Um, early, yes. Now, again, you got to tweak it. So sometimes if we have, like, three things going, yeah, we will have to go off the dial back a little bit. But I find that the kids rise to it eventually. Like, if, if they're not getting to that midline, well, if they're not doing it in practice, then they're going to be off in a game and you're going to be getting gashed anyway. You know, now that violation caused, you know, is going, going to cost you wins. Um, but sometimes, yeah, um, and I, I can't remember where I saw it. I don't know if it was yours. Did you have one on burpees? They had to, like, 
count the burpees for somebody. Somebody had one, one of the podcasts I was listening to where like, they would chart the violations and they wouldn't stop. But then the team left, when they left the floor, okay, hey, you weren't on the midline four times. You gotta go give me four burpees. Or you gotta give me like, you know, five push-ups or what, four push-ups or whatever. So that's the other way to do it that we're gonna experiment with this year. Um, it's just like doing something like that too to keep the flow going. That's it, yeah. Uh, second question again. You just talked about having time That's for the gym at every practice. Huh? Do you try to record some of this stuff every day so they have something they just did? Or so, is it mostly games based or looking online at some of Chris's stuff or looking online at maybe Mason's stuff or something like that? Can you ask it one more time? So you said you use film and practice yeah. almost every day or you try to? Uh, not yet, but that's something we're moving to. Moving towards. So, do you try to record mm -hmm. this stuff so they have something they just did so yep. they see themselves every day? So it's a, it's a, it could be a couple of different areas, right? It might be game film. You might sit and watch game film and say, okay, hey, look, we're not on the midline. We're not on the midline. We're not on the midline. Now when we play full four perfect position, that's our big thing. I don't even care about that. I'm really going to hammer the midline, right? It might be like at Tartan we did it a lot just to get a different setup. I would, we would play four and four perfect position. We would video it. And then we would watch it as a group, and I would have them point out what we need to work on for the next segment of four and four perfect position. You know, what they wanted the violations to be based on what they were seeing on the film. You know, and so we would do some of that too. But I think if you're going to do film, then I think you almost watch it immediately. And you just do it, and then you go back and you say, okay, we're going to correct these things. You got to get them warmed up a little bit again, or you get some injury if they sit. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we we coached together and done some of this kind of stuff, and, and but we it hasn't been at the varsity level, so that that's a question yeah. that I'll ask you. But um, you know we've used it as and, and we've you know, kept track of it and use it as reward essentially mm -hmm. for let's say the player that gets the most points in a given practice or whatever starts or yeah. does it. I mean, have you been able to find a way to work that into the varsity so, level? I haven't done it at the varsity level. When I was a sophomore coach, we did it all the time. Because yeah, right. I, I, one year at Tartan, I had a group of about four dudes who were really talented, but thought they were just a little too good for this. So then I just tracked the wins, and they didn't win, and so they didn't get the start. Uh, I'd like to, as, as we grow our program and we get deeper, I would like to move to that. To like some things like, hey, if, you know, if you're not winning in practice, why do we think we're going to win it and help us win in the game? And I think, but certainly every level below varsity, yes. kind of where everybody's coaching here, but certainly at the middle school and even the JV freshmen, yep. not just, well, maybe JV, but sophomore freshmen, yep. certainly I think it's got some... Oh, I love it. I mean, I think it's, and like I said, if we do it, I want to do that. Right. Because the other part you find, we still track all our wins. Right. Because what we start to find is that that kid that maybe isn't quite as like good looking when he walks in the gym, he's doing something to win games. You know, maybe he's just moving the ball well, setting screen, but his team is consistently winning games. And I know Art's not in here, but Art and I did it when he was my assistant coach for a year. Um, and we had this kid who was like our last dude on the bench. He was a B squad. Last guy on the bench, but boy, he won in practice. We started playing him more, and we found out we played better. And I don't know if I get it. It was just moving the ball, screening, but there was something we were missing that the data told us. It was like, okay. This kid's doing something. And even if you don't, even if you're not using it at the varsity level for playing time, I think keeping track of it so that the kids see that there's a value to do. Oh yeah. It. You know whether you, you know, whether you get a, a Gatorade at the end of the week or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, for those things, I think that feedback so they're not just saying, well, it's just another, this is another drill, another scheme. I agree. Uh, we're actually getting, we're actually, and that makes sense. I'm, yeah. I'm doing well at this, and I'm going to get rewarded somehow for that. Yeah. And we just put them up on a whiteboard at our managers room, but that's that's a great point. And I think that's something that y'all should take in is what are you going to do with the wins? How are you going to make the wins mean something? And I think that's a great point. Yeah. Kind of piggybacking off something you said the other day on Twitter as well. Are you using any of this for like pregame warm up type stuff? Um. Yes. No. So I'd love to, but but right now we've got guys who look. I don't want to mess with them mentally before the game starts. And they have some things they like that I don't like. They like to do layup lines. I don't love it. I'd rather have them do some other things. But part of me says when the game gets started, it's about them. And what's going to make them comfortable, what's going to make them go. Um, we do sneak in a little bit of 4 on 4 on 4 cutthroat. Um, I think we, you know, that's kind of the last thing we do before we bring it in to try to get them as warm as we're going to get them. But, yeah, I mean, in a few years I'm hoping 
we can move it to a spot where we're doing more. Anybody got anything else? That's good. All right, thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, fellas. I'll just say, fellas. Yeah, I think uh, if we go down the hall into the gym, I think Abe will be down there to speak next. And look, as always, does anybody not have like me on Twitter or my number? Or my, I'll write my email on the board and my Twitter handle. So if, and Twitter is where I do a lot of my socializing to my wife's dismay, but um, you know, I think if Twitter went bankrupt, she would probably be the happiest person. Uh, here's my Twitter handle. And then here's my email. And two things I, you know, I appreciate. Number one, if you've got games you do, email me and share it. Because I'm always looking for like some, you know, some more stuff. Um, second thing is this. I definitely should. I don't know it all. That's for damn sure. Um, but I, I believe in it. I love it. And all I would ask is this. You might look at this and say, nope, can't use any of it. Doesn't fit what we do. But I would at least want you to like think critically about, does, does what he said make any sense? You know, can I incorporate any of it? Because I think if you incorporate a little bit of it, you're, you're going to like it. You're going to do more. And Art, who runs the clinic, like I said, he's my B-Squad assistant for a year. And you know, we coached against each other, then he was out, then he you know, wanted to coach. And he was the guy who, why are we doing 15 minutes of shelter? Why don't we do this? And he pushed me more and more and more to be more games-based. And I've never looked back. So again, even if you just say, one practice a week, I'm going to try this crazy stuff. You know, or it may not be for you, and that's okay too. But again, I appreciate it. You can slide on down the hall and... Definitely email me anytime. I'll be more willing to help out.